Tea. After water, it's the most popular beverage in the world. It comes in black, green, white, and in many herbal forms. Herbalist Penny Boudreau takes us on a fascinating journey through the world of tea. Welcome to Richter's Seminars. This video presentation is from a series of free educational seminars on herb and garden topics offered each year at Richter's. So actually, um, not only do I work for Faunus Herbs for 18 years, but really my first education started probably as a child, just being outside, loving plants, and my grandma, um, really she's my first nature lover that I ever knew. And if you love nature, you're going to end up loving herbs, you're going to end up wanting your own teas, you're going to want to plant your own gardens, it'll just keep growing and growing. Um, but I also have my own little shop. I um, opened up a tea shop in Cannington a year and a half ago and it was great fun except it was way too much work and I'm sure Conrad knows that he's probably off doing something else you know he's not with his plants right now and so because I was so away from everything that I love I had to not do it anymore I broke my foot so somehow the universe told me to stop in my tracks and reevaluate what I was doing and I decided to no longer do the store I wanted to go back to just doing my herbal consultations and herb walks and all that fun stuff and my teas which I love but when I had the shop people would come in and sometimes say um, I would offer them I always had tea on and I would say, oh, you want to try a sample? And I'd try all kinds of tea. And they'd go, I don't like tea. March by, and I'd think, oh, how can someone not like tea? Because tea isn't just black tea, and that's what people seem to think. Tea is everything from picking, like, let's see, what, what is this? Oh, that's for me, actually. What is that one? Oh, so you would not think necessarily. So here we have catnip shown. And so right away, people would not think, to use catnip as tea. So even if you're out, so if you can't identify plants, the best thing to do is to buy them somewhere where, hello, you get this, <laughs> it says right on it. And then there's no problem with identification and you'll plant it somewhere and you'll remember. And maybe you'll even just have a tea garden that those things you plant in that garden are that you can ingest and go out and pick any time. But catnip, which makes the cat go crazy, if the cat comes over here, it might like this. But for us, it makes us relax and it's more calming. But you can just pick that and have that as a tea. So those people that would say, oh, they don't like tea, like, I'm sure they don't even realize that. And I'm sure they don't realize you can have rose petal tea. And I'm sure they don't realize there's like cold and flu tea. And an example on that wall, every one of those bags is a different pot of tea. So you could just go crazy with tea, which is what I like. So today, Julie Ditta is coming. So Julie would come um, to my shop and do tea leaf readings with people. And oh man, they loved it. It's so fun. And at first I was kind of, I was brought up pretty um, European. So I would, well, my family anyway, pretty, um, I'm going to say strict, proper. <laughs> so I thought, ooh, it's kind of evil. But not it's just fun and it's fun to have a cup of tea and then I found out afterwards actually that my dad's foster parents they used to read their leaves so that made it more okay for me um, but it's just fun the ritual of doing the whole tea leaf reading and seeing what it has to say so that's just a really fun part of today um, so if everyone could get a little bit of tea that would be great or if you'd like I can even pour it for you but if you want to just come up and get one, just a little bit to start, and then just, if you could just keep that cup. So I'm just going to give a little bit. You're welcome. There you go. You're welcome. So this is an organic green tea. And so actually, I'm going to let someone else pour the tea so any of you guys can start pouring. Okay, just take a little bit because there's still quite a few of you. And so the first thing we're going to do is start off with a poem. And so the poem is called Seven Cups of Tea by Lu Tong. And when you look at the dates, like that's how long tea has been forever around. Um, so. You can start sipping at any time, but to think that, so he begins, the first bowl 
So they would serve their tea in little bowls, not in cups and saucers. The first bowl sleekly moistened my throat and lips. The second banished all my loneliness. The third expelled the dullness from my mind, sharpening inspiration gained from all the books I've read. The fourth brought forth light perspiration, dispersing a lifetime's troubles through my pores. The fifth bowl cleansed every atom of my being. The sixth has made me kin to the immortals. The seventh is the utmost I can drink. So it's just a lovely little poem. I'm hoping there's going to be enough tea. Sorry, guys. I can make you more if there's not enough. So tea is actually a gift of the divine farmer. Um, so the divine farmer was Emperor Shenong, uh, or his become known as Divine Farmer. And to think that that's 5,000 years ago, like that's so long ago to think that tea has been um, around. And that's in China. And there's a neat story about him. Actually, I'm going to show you a picture of him because it's really quite hilarious picture. There he is. Isn't that a funny picture? <laughs> so it's a 1503 painting of him. Um, I, when I looked at that, I was like, whoa, that is hilarious. But the story goes that they would drink water that was always boiled. So their drinking water was boiled and it was hot. And one day he was sitting underneath a tree and some leaves gently wafted down, of course gently wafted into his cup. And he drank it and discovered a wonderful taste. And that was the Camilla census plant and that is how tea apparently began. Um, it's a lovely story, I'm not sure. Well, they, really no one knows if that is exactly how it began. But this person, uh, Shenong, he was the bestower of many gifts uh, to us. So he introduced the art of agriculture. Even to think, that's 5,000 years ago that he did the plow. And like, what were we doing here in North America at that time? We weren't even here. <laughs> so, you know, there was no plow. Um, dug wells, even to think they had dug wells. And just an interesting note, the number one drink in the world is water, of course, which it should be. Although I've met people who say they haven't drank water in seven years. I met a person who said that to me and I was like, oh my goodness. So every day drink water. <laughs> but the number one drink water. The second drink is tea worldwide. So, and keep your mind open. Remember tea. Look at her go with the timer. Awesome. Um, so remember that tea can be many, many, um, come in many forms. And now some of my favorites that he actually um, helped bring to the world is Chinese medicine, which is acupuncture, Chinese pulse medicine, if anyone's ever had that done, that's a fabulous um, uh, thing to have done. And lots of naturopaths know how to do that. And to think that he learned how to preserve seeds in horse urine. Like, I don't know if they do that here at Richter's or not, how they pr preserve their seeds. But I thought, wow, that's amazing. Who would even think, first of all, to use the horse's urine? Like, why not goat urine? Why the horse's urine? I have no idea. But I thought, wow, that is something. Um, and a, this Chinese proverb is so amazing because every day, um, this would be something to follow as a little mantra. I put little quotes around my house sometimes it's just but drinking a cup of tea will surely starve the apothecary so just to know that you can get your health from a cup of tea and so when you were to walk by that wall over there I'm sure there is dandelion or milk thistle for your liver or I'm not sure calendula if you need something soothing and healing to go from one end out the other end there'll be everything you need will be on that cupboard wall there for tea and actually, this cartoon depicts the first bit of acupuncture. Do you see that? <laughs> he goes, that's odd, suddenly my neck feels better. <laughs> Isn't that cute? I just thought I would throw that in there. Um, but then, since we were kind of on cavemen, I was thinking, gee, like, do we really think then that the Chinese invented tea? Did they invent all this tea, all herbal tea? Like, where did that come from? So when I was researching, um, you know, I found out about Neanderthals, 40,000 BC, that upon digging up a site where they found remains of Neanderthals, they found buried with them all of these different herbs. So they had like the daisy family, they had yarrow, 
um, St. Barnaby's Thistle, just the list goes on and on. And healing herbs, like even hollyhock. See, people don't realize, you can even pick your pretty hollyhock flower we used to at the tea room, sit that on the side of the plates and have a pretty, and you can eat it afterwards if you want to. Um, but I just thought that was fascinating to think that here they buried those. So that must have meant, if you're burying with someone, the great value of those plants. And that we just take them for granted today. So here, as I was saying, how he, um, tea was the thing that he was most known for um, bringing to the world. Um, but just to know that each tea is for an individual um, illness. So for example, what tea is that? I have up here my cold and flu tea. So I make a cold and flu tea. Love it. And the formula is a simple formula. It's yarrow, peppermint, and elders, elderflowers. That formula, and I say it's my tea. It's not really my tea. It is the world's tea because that formula I didn't create. It's been around for hundreds and probably thousands of years. And here even it can, you can see, you can have it growing in your garden just in plant form. Or you could even just have this at home, which looks pretty. You know, everyone loves to have plants at home. But you could just pick off of these when someone's feeling under the weather and make your own tea. I mean, it's that simple. All you have to do is add water. Um, but if you prefer you know, uh, dried, there's dried. And I just brought my stuff today because then later we can open the cans and make up some tea and you can take home, okay? Because uh, I didn't ask permission for that. Yes? Um, what makes the best yeah, I personally think fresh, but if it's the winter time and you haven't harvested properly <laughs> or got your supplies, you're going to want dried. And dried just keeps so long and it's so easy. So here, that's why when I said it's a candy store, I mean, it's so easy because if you want to just do that, that's easy. And you could make blends for gifts, which is really fun. Um, but yeah, I definitely like fresh. Let's see here. Oh, so here's a picture of a Camilla census plant. So today they make them small just for ease of picking and they just pluck the first three leaves. But I just have some notes there where there's a tree currently right now, the border of China and Burma, 3,200 years old. And they are still picking leaves from that tree. And one tea cake, so they would make cakes where they, they make them actually pressed together, but it sold for $40,000 because that's such a rare tree. Um, so just the value in that tree. So ceremonies. Um, I'm not sure in life if you guys do any ceremonies. The only ceremony I knew, so once I became 19 or 20 and I was thinking like, gee, what, a, what do we do for ceremony? A wedding. I guess we have funerals. But other than that, what is there? There's no, we have no rights of a young woman coming into womanhood or men. Um, but then I got to thinking about, well, there's tea ceremonies. So just making a pot of tea. If you love tea and you, um, you know, like I like playing with it, so I have to have everything. So I have the teapots and the little scoops and I, it's not really necessary, but it just makes it more fun and it makes it a ceremony, just the preparation. And if you were to see in China and Japan, you've seen them do the service, right? Where the women will in those little tight skirts and then they sit down and they do the little tea. Like it's really beautiful to watch and it truly is a ceremony. Has anyone done a kava ceremony? Have you just had kava? They say bula bula and then you drink your kava. Have you had that? Do you guys sell kava here? You do? Oh, awesome. So kava, do you sell the plant or the dried? Dried. So that is a fun thing to try. You need to look online about a kava ceremony. We do it all the time. So I also work for restorative medicine. We put on a um, herbal conference every year and it's has always been to date in the States, but we always on the Saturday night, <laughs> we get together and we have a party and we do kava ceremony. Um, so check that out, look online and you can get your kava here, which is really fun. Um, matcha tea, has anyone had a matcha tea? Because there's that whole ritual where you have to have the nice little ceramic bowl and your dried matcha, which is the highest antioxidants of any of your green teas. And you've got a little whisk that you, you don't touch the sides or the bottom and you do it like a W. And just the whole uh, act of making it is a ceremony. 
And then of course, Julie being here today, she's doing another ceremony. So that will be with the tea leaf reading. Um, could you pass me a cup and saucer, please? Of course. For a second. I just want to show you. So when you're, just so you're prepared, if you're going to go back there. So when you make tea for a um, tea leaf reading, so you have your cup and saucer, you pour your loose leaves in a teapot and you let it steep the right amount of time, kind of shake it around. And then you pour your tea in your cup, you drink it normal, and you wait till there's just a little bit of water left above your tea leaves. And then you'll take your cup and you'll flip it upside down. And then you turn it one, two, three, right back to where the handle was. And then you touch it and you have some intention, you know, or maybe ask a question and then you lift it. So then you'll have leaves in here and leaves and some tea here. So usually the reader starts at the handle and they work their way around the cup. This is most recent in a year. It's like a year. The cup is a year. Most recent and works her way around. So I've had a heart, a really big heart one time in the bottom of my cup, which was really quite neat. And I've had a dog, which is so heart, of course, is love. Dog is loyalty. You know, so just think of symbols. It's like looking at the clouds and trying to see pictures. She looks for pictures in the cup and saucer. And then she'll read your saucer same thing and then she usually does the cup again and then the saucer but some tea leaf readings can go on for an hour like it just depends on the reader and what you pay for <laughs> remember you always get what you pay for so quality is always more money than the dollar store like I do not know how I saw the other day someone brought into the herb farm some herbs in a jar and it was a glass jar a dollar I was like the cap so just from working there, the cap and the glass jar alone, we can barely buy for a dollar. How can they put something in it even is beyond me and sell it as a quality product. So remember to go and, and support local. I always love to support local. And remember that tea, when you serve tea to your guests, it's supposed to be a sign of hospitality. So whenever anyone enters your home, you should offer them tea. And then of course we have recent history, which of course was the famous Boston Tea Party. So of course tax revolt and everyone dumped, th and to think, 340 chests of tea. To get that tea there, just imagine the voyage it had to take to get there and to just dump it. So then the tea's dumped. Oh man, what's a tea lover to do? <laughs> then there's no tea. So they kind of shot their foot, except that there was a plant that I'm sure is here which I didn't have any at home, which I wanted to make a cup. So, but it's called Liberty Tea. And they took to drinking goldenrod and they drank the leaves and that was called Liberty Tea. So that is the tea that all those tea lovers drank when they dumped all their tea. So that's how they survived with no tea. And goldenrod, just actually, I'm going to mention it later. And I'm sure you, they'll have goldenrod here, I'm sure, especially maybe in the dried. And throughout literature, you'll find mention of tea, in, even in children's stories. So Peter Rabbit, you know when he got into all that trouble in Mr. McGregor's garden, at the end of the day, after all that huge kerfuffle, his mom gave him a dose of cam uh, uh, yeah, chamomile tea. So to think that that's something you can do with your children anytime, chamomile tea is just a beautiful tea. And that will be here. I'm Paul. Yeah, you have, and also there would be plants of chamomile that um, you also could get. I use chamomile in so many of my blends. So with your blends, once you start making them, you'll find certain teas like peppermint, chamomile. You'll have staples in your cupboard. And then you can just start mixing things and working together with them. But uh, getting back to recent history, so afternoon teas. Has anyone gone to a proper afternoon tea party? Hands up. Yeah. It's really fun. It's super nerdy, but it really is fun. Um, even though I had my tea shop and would do afternoon teas, my daughter still for Mother's Day took me to Toronto to the, uh, uh, is it Edwards Hotel? Yeah, for um, a tea party. Um, so anyway, tea parties started with Anna, the seventh Duchess of Bedford. So because of the way they used to eat, they have their noontime meal, and then they wouldn't eat till so late at night. In the afternoon, she started feeling not very well, which of course you don't feel very well if you're not eating properly. 
So she started having her maids bring her a cup of tea and a little something in her room. And then she made her feel so much better that she could hold off till dinner. She started doing it with her friends. And so that started a whole um, tea party uh, thing happening. So when you are preparing an afternoon tea, or any tea, you have to think of all these things. Taste, to know that you should have all those tastes, sweet, sour, um, and to know the difference, salty, and textures, crisp and smooth, and sight, that they look beautiful to the eye, like little sandwiches cut so pretty with chives tied, and having your pretty flowers on the sides. And it really, and even though that really sounds nerdy, I get excited, don't I, about it. I'm like, oh. But you go to the garden and pick your stuff. It's so fun. It really is. Um, and the smell. And actually smell, especially teas and any food you eat, it brings back nostalgia. You know when you eat something and it reminds you of your grandma or it reminds you of your mom or at the cottage or wherever and it just brings back those good memories. And some people love like cinnamons and vanilla and that just sets you, sets you off. But sound. We all want music in the background, but that's supposed to be subtle and quiet, and it's supposed to be conversation is your main, is your main thing. And today, so I brought a ton of stuff, and at first I wasn't gonna bring all this stuff, but I thought, how can I have in here that you have touch of a nice cup and saucer? I could have brought paper or styrofoam ones. That would not have been as nice for today's talk. So I thought, no, I have to bring all my stuff just so that it seems nice. Uh, and then to always give thanks and enjoy and take the time to enjoy what you're eating or drinking. And here's a typical tea. So you need two nerdy chicks. Do you see? That's myself and my daughter at my shop when we were doing a tea. So she'd come and help me sometimes. Uh, and you need, of course, your teapots. You need cup and saucers. You need to have your table set really pretty. You need to have clotted cream and jam. And you'll see in that picture, that was a winter tea, so I didn't have anything, but I had cedar. So I went out to the bush and just got some cedar, because you can make cedar tea too. Has anyone made cedar tea? Yeah, cedar tea is awesome. It's really good. Um, and then of course your um, serving dishes, there's a two-tiered one with your desserts. And meringue, how many of you guys eat meringues? Have you just had meringues maybe when you were little? Um, but those are another really great thing to have. So now here's just some facts about tea. So just the Camilla census plant alone, there's over 250 loose teas prepared from that. So it's just limitless what you can do. So China is the number one producer of tea. So China does green teas, oolong, pu'er, uh, white teas and black teas. India is the second major. Uh, and they like milky teas, so chais with milk in it. That's really where like our lattes come from, <laughs> that whole idea of milky teas. Um, and then, of course, they have a red tea as well. Europe, still the top teas in Europe, black tea, uh, and Assam Earl Grey, and Darjeeling. And I heard an interesting fact about Darjeeling once. And so I'm just giving you rough numbers. My numbers are wrong, but I'm just to give you the idea. Let's say that they produce um, 100 million pounds of, they don't do that much, 100 pounds of Darjeeling a year. They say at the end of the day, they sell... So if they make 100 pounds, retail they sell like 10 million pounds. So somehow, someone through the, the grower and the end guy, they're cutting it and they're mixing it with inferior teas. And so to know where you get your products, and again, I always go back to know who you get your stuff from because you need to trust them. And that's why like, I like to get my local honey. I like to get my... So this is great here. You can get your teas locally. You can go to your vegetable garden or vegetable stands locally. Um, but getting back to this, so Canada, basically our teas we drink are the same as Europe. But then I thought for Canada, I would just show herbally what we um, are our top three. So it's not very elaborate. Peppermint, chamomile, and rooibos. And to tell you the truth, neither of those, like, they're just that eh, for me. Yes. I thought rooibos was originally from South Africa. It's a red bush. What, where do I have it written? Canada. 
Oh, no, 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 it's not from Canada. Oh, I just it's popular. our most popular. So for Canada, I just chose what was our most popular herbal because we use the same as Europe, really, as our black. Yeah, so you're right on. And it's a red bush. Yeah, it's a bush. Um, but do you see out of our favorite herbal teas, like we could get a little more inventive, right? Because that's not very inventive. <laughs> Okay, so then, and I'll go through this fast, black tea. So it all starts with the same leaf, right, that is picked, but they're withered in a strong sunlight until they turn, turn brown. It's, uh, the taste is more sweet and honey-like fragrance. Um, and if you've ever tried an oolong, just the smell of it, it smells like wood. Pu'er, has anyone drank pu'er tea? Yeah, it's another great tea. Um, but just to think that it's a fermented and dry panned, which is kind of interesting. Um, but tea is good for your cardiovascular function, healthy circulatory, good for your cholesterol levels, bountiful in antioxidants, uh, very low in s sodium, obviously, and 20% of the caffeine in a cup of coffee. So if you ever wanted just to, you know, not even consume as much caffeine, just try knocking out one of those coffees for a tea. Um, green tea is steamed with very little oxidation. Um, it has five to ten percent caffeine in a cup of, like, than a cup of coffee. So green tea is really great for that. Um, it's a fat fighter, apparently belly fat, but I don't know. You'd have to drink a lot of tea. I'm thinking. Um, it keeps your energy stable, kills free radical cells, may help uh, against lung cancer and colorectal cancer, prostate cancer. Uh, and it even helps with wrinkling of skin, which, wow, who doesn't want that? So white tea. It is the purest and least processed of all the teas. It is um, lightly oxidized, produces a pale yellow beverage. Has anyone had white tea before? Yeah, really, you have to have basically nothing on your palate. So you wouldn't want it if you were going to be eating something because it's so subtle that you just need to just taste the tea. Uh, and if you were eating something else, you really won't um, notice it very much. But it's supposed to be the best for your skin and complexion. So that's really nice uh, to know, and it has very little caffeine. Rooibos tea, which is the red bush tea. Um, my mom was told that she wasn't supposed to have caffeine anymore in her tea. So there's, but yet she's a real tea nut. So I said to her, okay, so she was supposed to cut back. So one thing you can do is if you're just drinking normal black tea, when you have your, she always makes it in a mug, not a cup and saucer. Which, anyway, you can dip it in and you can dip it in your mug first and then pull it out and then put it in the cup you're actually going to drink because this the caffeine comes out first. So that first little bit you can just ditch. So then your next cup won't be as strong in caffeine. So there's that little trick. But then also she wanted to have just a tea with no caffeine. So really the rooibos tea was the tea that she enjoyed the most because then she could put her milk in like she always had, like a normal black cup of tea. And um, it was great. So that's now what she uses. But it also is great for weight loss. It's a source of vitamins and minerals, um, supports your immune system. So, so many benefits of rooibos tea. And there's also a yellow tea. Has anyone tried yellow tea? I haven't either. I've not seen yellow tea anywhere. Um, so, but I'll keep, always keep my eye looking because <laughs> I want to try all the teas. Um, but I thought that was interesting that it starts with damp leaves and they're allowed to wilt to the point of turning yellow and then they're wok fried. So there's such a process to making your tea. It's not just as simple as what we think. Um, and then the scented teas. So Earl Grey is the most common scented, tree, er, scented tea that we think of today, uh, infused with the rind of bergamot oranges, which is kind of interesting to think that they just use the rind and, and that's what it is. And then jasmine and citron essences are also um, used often to flavor the teas. And oolong is scented with lemon myrtle. So if you're adventurous, you could have herbal plants at home and just have a black tea and just add a little bit of uh, a herbal tea to it. Mate is a f uh, coffee lover's favorite tea and it gives the same amount of energy but not the jitters. So a lot of people, that is the common complaint with coffee. If Even some people just one cup, they find they get jittery. So it would be a nice tea to try. And it's very high in vitamins and minerals, which is another great thing. 
Now, blooming tea. Shoot, I meant to bring one and I forgot it. I can't believe I did that. Has anyone had blooming teas? Yeah, they're so beautiful. So if I do a shower for someone, I like to host things a lot. And so if I do a shower, I always put on like a little tea party, but that'll be a parting gift I would give the ladies is a flowering tea. And they're just a little hand sewn ball about that big. And they're actually hand sewn with a flower in them. So when you put it in a clear and you have to use a clear teapot, it actually just bursts open and there's the leaves and a flower inside. It's so pretty. It's really beautiful and it tastes really good. And so now when we get on to just talking about herbal teas, which really are my favorite, there is no black tea, green tea, yellow tea, nothing like that in a herbal tea. So a herbal tea is just using uh, flowers, seeds, roots, um, bark, fruits. Uh, they're usually very high in vitamin C's uh, and they're high in all kinds of nutrients and definitely uh, most cost effective too because you can wild craft once you learn what you're doing or plant plants and then have them in different flower beds so you know. And just to be safe because I bought a plant here and I do believe it was belladonna that you guys have here. and poisonous though, right? So you have to put it somewhere, which I did. I planted it way far out in my field, um, but nowhere near my other plants. But I just like when I'm walking, I'll go, oh, there's my belladonna. <laughs> and then I carry on. I haven't used it, but just knowing that I have it is my thing that I love, if I needed it. So here's goldenrod. So just to let you know, so not only were they drinking goldenrod because they didn't have any tea, but just look at the, how good it was for them. And sometimes it's hard to remember, do you see how there's so much, inf and that's hardly any information on goldenrod. There's so much information on what a plant does for you, how much you're being uh, benefited. But the obvious thing that I did with goldenrod when I was first learning was to learn that it was yellow. So pea is yellow, goldenrod's yellow, urinary. So I just knew that it was good for urinary tract infections. So that was like my very first little easy way to identify that plant and knew what it did. Um, but then our Native Americans boiled the leaves and used them topically for astringent and uh, antiseptics, um, wound healing, chamomile flowers, which they'll be chamomile flowers here. And chamomile flowers are so pretty. And that's the tea that we just saw in Peter Rabbit's story. Um, so they're a great tea for relaxing, but also anti-inflammatory, um, good for your stomach, carminative, your immune system, just a nice restful for before bed. It's a great tea. So if you love tea or having a coffee or something, just switch them. Yes? Um, how do the different varieties of chamomile? Is there one that you specifically like to use? Um, Roman chamomile? Roman? But you probably have German chamomile here as well, do you? Yes. Yeah. So, and you could even make a blend where with the two chamomiles and have a chamomile blend. Like I make a tea called mint medley just because I like mint. And so I just mix, you know, a few mints together. And peppermint is okay, but I love spearmint better. So, you know, just, and it'll be a personal thing. And that's, so you learn to blend your teas for you. Um, stinging nettle. Does anyone have stinging nettle on their property? Yeah. And I'm sure there's stinging nettle here. Yeah, excellent. Stinging nettle is amazing. Um, and it's a great, well, if you buy the plant, it's a great plant because it'll just grow. And then you can go out in the spring and you can pick it and you can eat it. You can make tea with it. You can dry it and have it in the winter for tea. It's so healthy. I add stinging nettle every day into my smoothie. Like I'll, I make tinctures too. So if you have the plant, that's a whole other talk though, isn't it? But you can make tinctures out of the tea, out of the uh, plant. And then I even squeeze some into my smoothie because it's just natural vitamins and minerals. Um, I love it. And it kind of makes me excited when I do all that stuff. It's like the more you get into it, the more you want to play constantly in everything you do every day. Oh, and actually there's a picture of stinging nettle. But one of the things I wished I hadn't known about stinging nettle was the growing pains when my kids were little. I never realized that. And I had one son who really suffered a bit with growing pains. And when they're on, like it's very painful. So I would have loved to have been able to have made him a cup of tea. 
And even if it was in his mind, I'd say, oh, this will make you better, honey. And then, you know, it's just nice to do that. Um, Colt's foot. Does any of you have Colt's foot? Or do you see Colt's foot? So it's generally the very first flower you see in the spring. And it's great for Colt. A lot of people will confuse it with dandelion. Um, the symbol um, above apothecary doors was a Colt's foot leaf. So that's the symbol for apothecaries. Um, but it's a great one. So if you had your cold and flu tea, which the cold and flu tea that I have is just the very simple one, which is yarrow, peppermint, and elder. But if someone had respiratory issues, you would just have that separate, you know, in your cupboard. And I'm sure there's dried over there, I would think. Um, and then you would just add it if someone had a respiratory problem. So it's that simple, just starting to learn what you've got and just adding to them. Peppermint. So you cannot say enough about peppermint, how great that is. And I get car sick still. Ever, so I've had car, get car sick ever since I was little. Um, but we'll always get a peppermint tea. So if we're out somewhere, like we traveled the East Coast last year, and oh my goodness, some of that driving was not good for me. So we, even Tim Hortons has peppermint. Not recommended if you have real good peppermint because you would want better peppermint. But when you're in a pinch, you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, so I thought that was really great. And there's a picture of peppermint. And there would be, oh, it would be so fun. They would have an, they have an awesome mint section because I bought tons of mint last year, like even pineapple mint and chocolate mint and like just so many. And so you can plant them all in your mint garden and then just go out and pick mint, all kinds for mint tea. It would be really great fun if you're into it. And I think you are. Um, so remember quality of tea is impacted by the way we grow, pick, process and purchase. So again, number one thing I like to say, buy locally. Really can't stress that enough. And whatever local is for you. Like I actually live Cannington. So even though it took me, I think 35 minutes to get here or 40 minutes, this is really my most local where I would say I could get quality plants um, for in my garden. And where I would trust because I want to, uh, in my garden at home, I don't use, um, any pesticides or anything like that but I want to know that I'm starting with a plant from somewhere that I can trust because if I was to go into I don't know a big box store we all know they're everywhere I wouldn't trust where that came from I would have no idea um, and it's also nice to support local people and it gives jobs to your community um, certified organic so certified organic is really interesting I have heard so many people say different things like, um, well, it's really, you're, really, you're really not organic. No one's really organic. It means you're allowed to put so much pesticides or so much this or that. If you are truly certified organic, you do have to adhere by really strict um, rules and regulations and you are inspected. And Faunus Herbs, where I work, is certified organic, but that is, mostly because it's a medicinal medicine is what we're doing. Um, and the rules and regulations are getting so strict that it's actually making it pretty impossible for someone to even adhere and meet all the rules that the government's making because they're making it impossible to grow plants um, with all their rules. Some, one of them needs to come down from wherever they are and work in a greenhouse someday or out in a field just to see how difficult what they're asking. So ethically wildcrafted. So I was saying to you earlier about how like this plant catnip, so if you don't know what catnip is or maybe you don't have it growing at home. So I would look, okay, I'll use belladonna as my example because I have this growing everywhere. It likes to be in the paddock with the horses along the fence for some reason. So I always know I can just go there and get catnip. But a plant like belladonna, which I do not have on my property, I would want to plant it far away from buildings. I would want it just where there's no bad runoff or not close to the road. Um, and then I could start harvesting off it. And I would never pick it clean. Or if I bought five plants, let's say, and started a little colony, you would never get rid of a whole colony or plant or pick three quarters of it. You would always leave behind um, some of the plants so that they can uh, regrow. And if you just actually see wild plants growing, like maybe St. John's wort, 
Do you guys actually have St. John's wort here? You yes, do, awesome. So I have, uh, see isn't that wonderful? Like it's like everything I'm saying there is right here. So if I'm out walking, so I walk a lot with my dogs, um, it's like, have you ever heard the expression when you're walking that if something catches your eye, so you'll be walking along and all of a sudden St. John's Ward will be like, oop, here. And it's like, oh, maybe I'll make a cup of tea of that. So it's like nature's calling to you. So it's great to pick that, but you wouldn't pick them all, right? So just know how many you have. And if you want to, because they're somewhere like this, you know, you could make it um, your colony grow more, have more of them out in your field or in your garden. Uh, my neighbor has wormwood growing and I'm like, how come he has wormwood and I don't? So I have to get over there and pick some of his. But maybe there's wormwood here. And then there is. And so you could, you know, so it's just learning all that thing. And the more plants I have and I identify, the more I want. And it just keeps going that way. And you'll find you'll get that way as well. But picking, when you're outside picking, so even in your own garden, um, and you'll hear conflicting information, so just pick when you feel that it's a good time and listen to yourself. But morning is a great time to pick in the fresh hours. Uh, evening you can pick also in the evening. You wouldn't pick medicinally on a cloudy day. You wouldn't pick, um, you know, seven in the morning or something, but we normally pick between 10 and two. When you know when the bees are the busiest, that's when you wanna pick. So you watch the bees. The bees know when to be out and about working. And so you should be working with the bees. So processing teas. So you can dry tea, like I noticed, actually I got to go in the back room there and use the washroom. And as I was going towards that area, I noticed they have the dryer. Can't miss the dryer. So it's like, ooh, that's fun. So someone gets to pick and put the stuff in the dryer and then it ends up in the bags that you get. So it's neat to see that. And here especially, to know that, so when I notice the dryer, it's like, ah, oh, so they get to do that right here. So why would you choose something that's been kicking around for who knows how long somewhere else in a grocery store? Um, but also know when you're working with, with your herbs, you wanna use stainless steel stuff, you don't wanna use plastic bowls, um, and you never wanna use um, aluminum or copper either. And remember that the, how you pick and you process um, adds flavor, color, and chemical properties to your food, or to your teas. So remember that to pay attention to what you're using. Oh, and look at what I got off the internet. A Richter's herb thing. I thought I was so smart. Um, purchasing herbs. So you can purchase fresh herbs. Um, and so of course when you're looking, you would choose, you know, everyone's choosy when they're picking their herbs, right? And you look through, and I usually always want the fullest looking one where I think I can get the most off it for the most tea. Um, but you would choose the healthiest and the freshest and the tenderest looking. Dried herbs should look and smell about the same as when they're fresh. So uh, that's a good thing to keep in mind. But also to remember a reputable grower and supplier, right? You need to be able to trust people in life. And actually, that trust issue for me was huge. Like, you know, if you need herbs and you'll go into some, even a pharmacy, they'll have walls of herbs. How on earth do you know what one is the best? How would you know what echinacea is the best? Like when there's all these different companies. So for me, I like to think simpler. I would rather go somewhere, if there's only one choice here, and I don't have no idea if there is or isn't, I would choose the one choice over choosing the 20 choices because I just know I could trust it. Um, and also there's four ways to tell if a herb uh, has retained its potency. So color, so remember what a, a rose should look like if you have rose petal tea. Uh, smell, they should smell. And it's called organoleptic testing actually when you use color, smell, taste, and effect. So if you're trying to tincture, you should feel that little tingling under your tongue, numbing feeling. Um, but it's the same with all your herbs. So storage of tea. So your tea should be stored in a temperature controlled environment. It should not be in the bright sun basically, right? So like here they're in dark bags. I store mine like in 
uh, airtight bags. And so these are airtight and light tight, and so are these. So I just use the tins just because I have all kinds of shelves at home. And tea can last, like certain companies have to put, do you guys have an expiry on your teas actually? Two years, four years, no, no expiry? Because I honestly think it's not necessary myself. Some places you'll go and you'll see that, but they can last years and years. And just by using that taste, smell, um, thing that we were just talking about, that's how you can test yourself for your teas. Just make sure you store them properly. I'm just going to ask a question about, for instance, with that like golden rod. How do you use the flowers or do you use the leaves? That was the leaves for the, for the Liberty Tea, uh -huh. but the, fla the flower for the urinary. Yeah, so you'll learn, and there's actually a bunch of good books over there too, her books I was noticing. Do you guys have her books, anyone? Does anyone? Yeah, because once you start on that too, that's another thing. You'll just keep getting more books. It's like, ooh, I don't have that one. And you'll get all kinds of good recipes in them. So what I do when I get a good bo new books, I just go through with cue cards and I write out new recipes, new recipes, and I keep a, a card index folder and I keep them all just in there, all filed. But it's great. And storage of tea, there was a picture of teapots there because that starts with preparation. The reason you have a teapot, you keep a lid on it so the volatile oils do not leave. So if you make it in an open cup, at least sit. Like I've done that before at home, I have um, ceramic cups. I'll just sit even a saucer on top just while it's steeping. So important to remember, a hot tea, it's one teaspoon of and so I'm saying tea for herbs. One teaspoon of whatever herb you're using per cup of hot water. And an iced tea, you can make iced tea with any tea you want to, and you just use two teaspoons per cup of hot water and then you pour it over ice. Um, and when you hear inf the word infusion, an infusion is just your flowers, leaves, stems, and that's uh, steeped in hot water three to five minutes. And when I say hot water, it's usually 195 to 208 degrees. Um, a decoction, which is what you would do if you purchased berries, or sorry, if you purchase seeds, bark, um, or um, roots, and that's one to three teaspoons simmered in um, water for 10 to 20 minutes. So steeping time. So all teas are kind of different times. So oolong is three minutes, green tea is one to two minutes. And if you want your tea stronger, you don't leave your bag in longer. You add more tea to your bag and do it for the right amount of time. Because the longer you leave it, um, it lets bitters in there and other things and it just changes the taste. How, so that is like with green tea, white tea, black tea. However, with herbal tea, I do all kinds of things that I feel like doing. So uh, if it's just for uh, good taste, you know, three to five minutes is great just because it's a beverage. But if you want it medicinally, you may want to make it stronger. And if you're cheap or chintzy, <laughs> you sometimes want to reuse your bags, which I do that all the time with herbs. I'll have a pot going of some tea that I make and I'll just, so let's say you put four teaspoons in one of those pots, I'll just then add a new, one new fresh teaspoon in there. But then, and I just keep topping up. So I'll do that all the time because they're still perfectly good. And that's the thing when you have good quality herbs, you can do that, right? You can just tell by taste. And here's an example of an infusion, how to make an infusion. Um, but I pretty much already explained that. Oh, but the neat thing is as well, so you can do it with a kettle or you can do it um, and steep it, or you can put it in a pot of cold water and then have that on the stove and bring that to a boil. Or you can do it um, overnight in a solar or lunar infusion. I don't know, has anyone ever tried that before? You have, that's nice. Yeah, so it's just something fun to try. You can do it in a mason jar. And even some people have done it before where you bury a hole in the ground and you make your tea, you put your, so let's say chamomile in there. And then you put the lid on, you bury a hole and you put it in under the moonlight. So you'd wait for a full moon, <laughs> that whole nine yards. But that's a ceremony. That's just something fun to try. Especially if you were camping or something, it would be fun. Um, this is just explaining to you how you can uh, do decoction, which I already explained. Um, but it's the easiest is to just put it on a pot on the stove. But in any herbal book, it will tell you how to do that. And now even with the internet, 
it's that kind of information is readily available. Blending. So that was a pretty picture, but it doesn't look pretty there. That's my dream tea. So I drink that tea every night before bed. And so there'll be a tea there um, that will be similar for going to sleep. Um, so mine's not to go to sleep, it's a calming tea. So there'd be calming blends. Um, so just the whole idea, we'll do some blending quickly over here too, uh, just for you guys to learn. So I brought with me today, so tea blends. So if you want, we have, um, I need to look at this. Actually, I'm gonna come out this way. This thing's falling off my head, sorry guys. So sage tea. So I have some bowls here if someone wants to help make some stuff. But here, for example, is teas that I make. So I have a mint medley. So Richter's was kind enough to bring up some actual plants to show that you can just make it with the plants or with the dried. And here's cold and flu, that's the tea that I make. And here's the tea in this tin, but then they brought the fresh stuff up so you could see, and just to smell it, even and touch. So that's what you do when you're picking stuff. Do you guys know you go always when you're checking your herbs and just smell what they smell like. And this is my petals tea. And I only made that because it's pretty, you know, like there was no other reason. And roses are in it. And do you know what they say? If someone has a broken heart, you give them a rose petal tea. I was like, oh, that's so pretty. Uh, luckily, I've never had to give anyone that. But I'm ready, I'm ready. So if someone ever came to me, I'd be like, oh, I got rose petal tea. Um, but anyway, so you can blend up some teas, okay? Um, but we can even do some blending when the tea leaf reading's going on, because uh, I'm fine with that. And this sage tea, oh, this is so good. So what was yesterday? The, on Friday, I went to Georgina Island. I grew up with a lot of the native girls over there. So I go over there and we just do workshops sometimes. So because, of course, being native, I try to use more native stuff with them. But I made, we made the sage tea over there. And so they were happy because we also did a spice blend. Um, because you know they use sweetgrass, but only in ceremony, they never eat it. So I make a spice that is sage, cedar, and sweetgrass, and it's so yummy. So we made that, and we made tea, and all kinds of stuff. So that's fun, and that was one of the teas that they really liked. So we'll do that blending part after then, okay? I'll just get through this. Um, oh, but another thing is, when you're looking at, okay, this is a trick. So if you look at um, Richter's teas over there, look at the formula. This is what I do. I look at the formula. So this mother's milk formula, so that's been around forever. Everyone who blends tea knows that fennel, fenugreek, and blessed thistle is great for um, nursing mothers. But if you didn't know that, you could take a picture with that and then you could come somewhere and you could go in there and buy the plant yourself and then you could just grow it yourself at home or it's a great gift if someone was pregnant at a baby shower you could even buy them those plants and then say here's for your mother's milk tea I just think it would be fun if I if I was doing all that again I would definitely love that but just to look at what the recipes are the formulas and then you can duplicate it you can get the plants and that's very cost effective to do that so keep that in mind because it can get costly and you want to do things as economical as, as possible. So by having your own supply of plants, that's a good way to save money. So dr there's a quote, drink tea and live long. I love that quote. And that is what I'll use to end the actual formal talk. So thank you very much. I have, I have a question. I Right. And once I went to a, I was at West and I went to a big tea shop, the giant teapot on top, and I ordered herbal tea. And they bring it to you in a pot about this big, and I'm drinking it, thinking it's lovely. And then my eyes started to burn, and my stomach was upset, and I said, does this have caffeine? She said, oh yes, herbal tea has caffeine, which most people are not aware of, unless you're real where does the caffeine come from in a verbal, in, in a fruit tea? Yeah. Like, I, so right off the hop, my first thought on that, and I apologize if I sound mean, that person doesn't know what they're talking about anyway. They're just working in a tea shop. Okay. That sounds mean of me. Doesn't that sound, that sounds really mean of me. No, and I apologize for that. 
So you have to also know, you need to talk to people who know what they're talking about. So, for example, if you were to come here and buy tea, if you're buying dandelion leaf tea right here, there will not be caffeine in that. It's a dandelion leaf. There's no caffeine in dandelion leaf. Do you know what I mean? So, and there'll be people here that you can ask, like if you don't know. And when she uses the broad word, herbal teas have caffeine, how, how is that possible? That you can't possibly have thousands of tea and say they all are the same. They're not. They're as unique as we are, you know? So you just have to do some research because there's tons of teas you can drink with no caffeine. There are some herbal teas It'll be a herbal blend of some kind. Okay. Yeah. So it'll be no different than me wanting to have um, like a green tea could have, oh, I do, I have a green tea that has some fruit in it and has some other herbs in it. And someone may call that a herbal tea. And they could put it under that section. Because also tea companies, like that is a tea company over there, my tea tins, that's Metropolitan Tea Company. The people I talk to on the phone there, they really don't know tea either. Right? I'm sure the person who started the company knows tea. But, you know, it's not everyone's passion, so you need to research what you can drink. And that... Sharon's daughter got a beautiful tea set, a tea, different tea blends. And even then, we had to look at it because some were higher content of caffeine, minimal, zero. I had to read them before. Yeah, I so rooibos, but rooibos tea, when we were just talking about that. Red bush, it's not... So Camilla Census is the black tea that has caffeine in it. Right? That, and coffee has caffeine in it. But you would need to research definitely when if you're allergic. What has caffeine? Like that would be my big research. What has caffeine in it? Chocolate. So you wouldn't want maybe, ah, here's something else. Chocolate mint tea. Here chocolate mint tea is a real mint plant that tastes like chocolate. From a tea company, they put chippets in, peppermint, and call it chocolate mint tea. Totally different because there's caffeine in that chocolate. That mint out there tastes like chocolate mint. That's a two totally different things. So thank you very much. So if anyone wants to blend up a little bit of tea to take home, uh, we can do that. Okay. Thank you. At Richter's, it's not just a garden, it's a whole new world. For herb plants, seeds, veggies, and more, visit us at richters.com or call 1-800-668-4372.